Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Today I'll be talking about a way to do almost linear time permutation check. This is joint work with Benedict Bones and Zachary DiStefano at NYU. So let's start by looking at the definition of permutation check. It states that given polynomials f and g, their outputs are permutations of each other if and only if there exists a polynomial sigma mapping between the same uh, bull uh, a Boolean hypercube of the same dimension, such that f of sigma of x is equal to g of x over the Boolean hypercube. So let's look at in, in a quick example. Throughout this talk, I will use mu to represent the dimension of the Boolean hypercube we're working with, and n equals to 2 to the mu to represent the number of elements in the permutation. So suppose mu is equal to 2, and therefore n is equal to 4. And suppose we're given f such that its outputs over the Boolean hypercube are 77, 96, 91, and 28. Now we're also given g with outputs 96, 28, 97, and 77, uh, sorry, 91 and 77 over the Boolean hypercube. We can see that the blocks of the same color uh, hold the same values. So f and g are indeed permutations of each other. This implies that there exists a permutation polynomial sigma, which maps from the indices on the G table to the corresponding indices uh, of the same color blocks on the F table, such that F of sigma is equal to G uh, on all four of these indices. Okay, so that is the basic permutation check formulation. There is also a closely related formulation called the prescribed permutation check for which we need to prove that the equality holds for a specific permutation polynomial sigma. This requires proving that the provided permutation polynomial actually maps to zeros and ones. Uh, and this can be done by using an additional sum check on top of the proving scheme for the basic permutation check. We will not have time to go into the details of this today. So for today, we will only focus on the basic permutation check, assuming the permutation polynomial sigma is pre-computed and committed to. Okay, why do we care about permutation check? Well, perm check is at the heart of proof systems. In circuits, particularly, we need to prove the correctness of wiring. In other words, the prover needs to show that the inputs to each gate are indeed the outputs of the correct gates from the previous layer. This is proved using permutation check with a pre-computed uh, permutation polynomial. So the wiring or the permutation polynomial is committed to as part of the circuit description. And then we perform a perm check to show that the inputs and outputs of the gates are consistent with the committed wiring. Besides circuits, perm check also has applications in memory checking where we prove all the reads and writes are consistent. In the classic offline memory checking idea, we compile the list of reads and writes by doing read before write and write after read. And in the end, we do a perm check to prove that the initial state and the read list together is a permutation of the write list and the final state. Permutation check is also highly related to lookup arguments. Here we have the basic permutation check formulation, and all we need to change to turn this into a, a formulation for lookups is to replace the sigma with a lookup polynomial row that now maps from one hypercube to another hypercube of different dimension. Then in the formulation, f will represent the lookup table, and g will represent the witness vector. Lookup arguments are also used for proving machine computations. For example, Jolt used Lasso, and Proofs for Deep Thought used Logup. So how was a permutation check previously done? Well, the most common way is to reduce it to a univariate product check. We'll prove that the product of f of x plus a random value is equal to the product of g of x plus a random value over the Boolean hypercube. This is equivalent to saying that the product of these fractions is equal to one. When the product check is instantiated, the variable is replaced by some random challenge R. The product check requires linear commitments and has a soundness error of n over the field size. Well, this is because to prove it, we need to commit to all n partial products and show correct composition and equivalence. What this means is that uh, let's call the k partial product PP of k. It is the product 
of the, these fractions from x equal to all zeros to x equal to k. And the prover will use a zero test to show that the nth partial product is one, and every intermediate partial product is indeed the previous partial product times the kth fraction. Notice that because the random challenge R is field size, which means lambda bits, the partial products are also lambda bit long. So committing to them and it is expensive and can be wasteful because we always need to commit to a total of We always need to commit to a total of n lambda bit elements, even if the, the outputs of f and g, which comprise the witness, is much smaller than lambda bit. Lambda is required to be at least 256 under discrete logarithm assumption and at least 120 in hash-based systems. So for example, say all the table entries, the outputs of f and g are only 32 bit long, but we are using a 256 bit field then committing to these partial products incurs an A times overhead. There was work in 2020 called Quarks, which also reduces perm check to product check, but uses multilinear polynomials instead of univariate ones. And in 2022, Habak introduced an alternative way, uh, largely known as logup, to perform permutation check by using the logarithm derivatives of product check. However, in all of these works, the linear wasteful commitment cost and the n over field size soundness error persist. A quick note that the previously mentioned wasteful uh, commitment uh, cost can be saved by using GKR because GKR allows us to only commit to the inputs and outputs and not any of the intermediate values. However, using GKR requires log n rounds of some check. This leads to worse verifier time, worse proof size, and worse soundness, and is certainly too large to be put on the blockchain. Moreover, GKR is expensive for recursion and parallelism, um, and there is also a recent attack against the fiat shamir soundness of convoluted GKR circuit, which, even though it does not break the aforementioned solutions to permutation check, still cautions against applying fiat shamir to deep GKR circuits. Okay. So what did we manage to achieve? I'll introduce a way to perform permutation check using only two rounds of sum check. We have better soundness than previous permutation checks. Our soundness error is only polylog n over the field size. The commitment cost uh, is the cost of committing to the witness plus the opening cost of the polynomial commitments. So we do require using polynomial commitment schemes with sublinear opening costs, such as KZH or Dory. The total number of field operations done by the prover is asymptotic to n log log n, uh, hence the title, almost linear time. The verifier cost and the proof size are both logarithmic, and the resulting permutation check can be used to replace any existing permutation check and can also be extended to lookups. All right, now let's dive into the details of our solution. In 2022, Hyperplunk introduced a way to reduce permutation check to some check, but has undesired prover cost. We will start from that. So first, let's look at the naive formulation of permutation check. We observe that this term on the left is quadratic, so we can move it out of F by using a simple multilinear extension. And since sigma is a permutation, sigma is injective and therefore invertible. So it is equivalent to writing eqx comma sigma of inverse of y. Now observe that the left side of the equality is degree mu in x. And the right side is also degree mu in x. Since they are both multilinear in x, then they must be the same polynomial if they agree over the entire Boolean hypercube. This implies we can apply short zippo to test whether the left and the right hand side are the same polynomial by using a random challenge alpha. Okay, so we can run some check for, to do this. The problem with efficiency is that this EQ term here is a big product of mu bitwise EQs which means it is degree mu in each bit of y. And the sum check costs O n 
times log squared and field multiplications. This is where Hyperplonk stopped in 2022, and we will continue. So our idea is that take the first round of sum check, for example. We could compute all the possible polynomials EQ can take on. So suppose we call them EQ1, EQ2, et cetera. We can flip the sum. So instead of summing over, uh, instead of summing up the F polynomials within each bucket of E, sorry. So instead of summing up um, in this fashion, we can sum up each F polynomial within each bucket of EQ and then multiply with the corresponding EQI. Then the number of field multiplications only depend on the total number of buckets. So the total number, by the total number of buckets, I mean the total number of distinct polynomials EQ can take on and the degree of each EQI. This trick would be great if the total number of buckets is sublinear. So let's look at how many buckets there actually are. Observe that the sigma inverse in the first round of sum check must be among one of the four polynomials. It can be zero or one or y or one minus, one minus y, and that's it. Because it is degree one in capital Y and it maps to zero or one. This implies that EQ has four to the mu which is n squared total possibilities. Well, unfortunately, this is obviously way too many buckets to work with uh, because there are too many terms in the EQ product. It would be great if the product has fewer things. So it, say if the product only has p things, then the EQ only has four to the p possibilities. The solution then intuitively is to break the computation into chunks. Right now we have mu things multiplied together to yield this EQ term. We can break the big product into partial products, each with fewer terms. So say we break them into L chunks, then we multiply the terms, the mu over L terms in the first chunk into some middle value, which we call mid one comma y. And we do the same for all L chunks. So we have mid two comma y all the way to mid L comma y. Then we will multiply all the L chunks together to yield the same EQ term we had before. Since each mid is a product of only mu over L terms, they only have four to the mu over L possibilities in the first round of sum check. So how many chunks do we actually need? What should the value of L be? Well, observe that as small as L equals to three already achieves sublinear number of buckets in the first round of sum check because four to the mu over three is equal to n to the two thirds. But unfortunately, the solution is not that simple because the number of possible polynomials sigma can take on increases exponentially with each sum check round. Specifically, there are four to the k in the kth round, which implies four to the k times mu over L for each chunk. So after careful computation, which I will skip today, we found that we need L to be at least four log mu and hence the log log n factors in our proof of cost. To put together, we will use a mini two-layer GKR circuit to prove permutation check, applying the bucketing trick in the process. The first layer computes the equivalence of the basic per permutation check, except that um, we, bu uh, we put them into chunks instead of computing the entire uh, EQ product with mu terms. The second layer computes every mid for every y in the Boolean hypercube and every uh, chunk, so for j from one to l, each mid is a multilinear extension of the j chunk, which means it's a product of mu over l terms. The resulting number of field operations is asymptotically and log log n. Our solution can be extended to lookups, lookups quite easily 
But the challenge in applying the same trick to lookups is that the lookup polynomial row is not injective, which means we cannot simply write eq x comma row inverse of y like we did with sigma previously. So what we ended up doing is first we'll add an outer eq for x, uh, where t is the random challenge, and then essentially flip the summations and use a pseudo inverse. So instead of iterating over every y in the hypercube, we'll iterate over the images of rho and sum up all corresponding x that maps to the image. We'll run the naive sum check for the outer sum over y, and then apply, apply the two-layer GKR trick with bucketing for the rest. The asymptotic cost is also on the order of n log log n. So uh, there are a few future directions. First of all, obviously, is to get the proof of cost down to actually linear field operations with very small constants, while preserving soundness, verifier cost, and proof size. As I was preparing these slides last week, we actually came up with a way, um, but puts extra restrictions on the PCS choice. We will also work on implementation and benchmarks, and our paper will be out on ePrint soon. Thank you. <laughs>